Okay, so welcome everyone to the Radiant Torah with uh, insights and inspiration from Rabbi Nachman of Breslov and the other Sadiqim. And um, we want to thank Dr. Eleanor Agudis for sponsoring this year. Week after week, we get to enjoy the weekly Parsha with a lot of um, hopefully inspirational commentary. Okay, so I this week we are going to attempt to do two partio. And the reason is, is because we have coming up this Shabbat after Yom Kippur, we have Parsha Ha'azinu. And then we have Sukkot. And then on Simchat Torah, we have the um, we have the uh, uh, last parsha of the to of the Torah, um, parsha Vizot Habracha. And so, what I want to do is quickly give you an overview. Ha'azinu is a very special song, and that's the whole parsha is a shira. Okay, and that's a song of prophecy. And the Zod Habracha is um, Moshe's blessings to the tribe as well as his death. Okay, so this is more preparation for Moshe going to Hashemayim. Okay, and um, in this Parsha Ha'azinu, um, this is um, one of the 10 songs of prophecy in the Torah, okay? We have nine songs in the Chumash and the Nach, so the Tanakh all together, that are called Shirot, okay, which is the feminine. That's how they are pluraled. Okay, and the plural for the tenth song, which will be in the time of Mashiach, if we want, is a is would be a shir or a shirim. So this is a shira, shirot is the plural, and the tenth song is a shir or shirim. Why are the first nine songs in the feminine? So the Medrash tells us that the first nine songs are classified as shirot or as a shira each in the feminine because they represent the, um, the process of labor, of giving birth, okay? And in that process, it's a very feminine process of contractions and breath and rest and more contractions and breath and rest and so on. And the nine of the shirot, nine of the, of the shira, okay, they are representing the feminine, okay? The 10th song represents the masculine, which is the completion or the birth, okay? So we understand that this is a very, very special Parsha, not that every Parsha in the Torah isn't, every Parsha in the Torah is, but it's a, um, it's a unique Parsha in that this is, the whole, whole Parsha is basically Moshe's song. And Moshe sings this song, and then later on in the Parsha, he and Yehoshua are going to teach the B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel, the song. So we have a song. It begins with a song. So what is this? Um, what is this with a song? So I want to just read you a little bit, or at least refer to a little bit of what um, Reb Nussin says, Reb Nachman's leading uh, student, scribe, Sadik, Talmud Chacham, and so on. He says, look, Hazinu contains a lot of rebuke in it. It contains a lot of praise and positivity as well, but it contains a lot of rebuke. Why is it called a shira, a song? You know, you don't think of a song as scolding someone or correcting someone. You usually think of a song, at least in the context of a song of prophecy, something more uplifted. So Reb Nussin explains that Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher, was able to 
really not only intellectually understand, but fully with every fiber of his being, understand all the deepest meanings of the Torah. And because he was at such a deep level, he could affect a kind of um, a kind of a forgiveness for transgression. Okay. And of course, this is appropriate for this time of year with Yom Kippur coming up in two days. So uh, because he could do this, he could take this rebuke embedded within the song and transform the children of Israel's errors and missteps into merits, okay? That's why we call it the song. Because even though there is a lot of rebuke in it, when Moshe sings it, it's a song of love. It's a song of love for the Jewish people. Moshe describes Hashem's love for the Jewish people, the uniqueness of the Jewish people, as well as prophecy for when we mess up. And when we mess up and we need correction, that correction comes sweetly in this shira. Okay. So the Parsha begins. Ha'azinu hashamayim v'adabera. Okay, so listen, heaven. Okay, talking to the heavens. Okay, uh, and I'm going to speak. The sishma ha'aretz imrefi, and may the earth hear the words of my mouth. Okay, so Moshe begins ha'azinu by saying, "Hey, listen up, hashamayim, the heavens." And listen up also, Haaretz, the earth, okay? Um, and the reason that he uses this beginning is because heavens and earth are eternal. They are eternal witnesses to the Torah, eternal witnesses to this song, okay? It's no good saying to, you know, Mr. Mr. or Mrs. Jew standing there listening, hey, listen up, pay attention. You're my witness because this is an eternal song. And each person, of course, is an eternal. Our souls may be, but as a, as a human being, we're not necessarily eternal. So first Moshe Rabbeinu is calling the witnesses. Moshe is calling the witnesses. Okay, now he he uh, continues, Ya'arof kamatar likhi, tizal katal imrasi. Okay, may my Torah, my teachings drop like rain, and may my, um, my words or my utterances flow like the dew. Okay, so Moshe is comparing the Torah to rain. Why rain? Rain is essential to life. Without water, okay, there is no life, okay, without other things as well. But when we think of, uh, let's say, being in a desert and feeling weak and needing something, we need water. So we can compare in our heads the whole world to a desert. And what do we need to feel alive, to revive ourselves? We need rain. We need dew. We need water. We need Torah. Okay, Torah is compared to really the waters of life. By Torah, so many of you already know this, but there might be some of you who need a refresher. When we speak about Torah, that we can be referring to a few different things. We can be referring to the Torah scrolls, which contain the five books of Moses, okay, the Chumash, Okay, like for Hamesh, five. And we can be referring to the Tanakh, which contains Torah and, and um, prophets and, and writings. Okay, and that's the entire Hebrew Bible, okay, which the whole world recognizes. And sometimes we can refer to, let's say, the teachings of Rebbe Nachman or any other tzaddik as a Torah. And we can take the entire teachings of all of authentic, Jewish wisdom and call them Torah. Okay. Torah literally means teachings. Okay. So even though we're 
in the five books of Moses, we understand that Moshe was a, a, such a prophet that he had insight into future Torah that was going to be um, going to be given and spoken and what would happen next because he was a prophet he was the greatest prophet who ever lived and how did he attain that greatness a few ways but primarily through his um, faculty of being able to be bittle to bittle his ego to nullify his ego and to make within himself a space to receive Hashem's words, Hashem's teachings, Hashem's love, and so on. In order to receive Torah, there has to be an empty space inside each of us, okay? If we are filled up, even with good things, okay, but, but that they're attached to our identity and our ego, and again, even good things, we still need to find a hollow, a, a space, preferably within our hearts as well as our heads for Torah, for the teachings and wisdom. Okay, now, um, I want to, okay, so the Torah is like rain, we've got that, and there was something else as well. Okay, so I want to give some of the reasons also why the Torah was compared to rain by Moshe. So we know that it's vital for the survival of creation, that we know. Also, just as rain comes from above, and, and Moshe Rabbeinu is, is speaking about rain and dew and so on, that's how we receive the Torah. We receive the Torah from above. Every time it rains outside, every time you see, even, even snow outside, think of, it's from above, like a Torah. Remind yourself of Torah. Always remind yourself of Torah. That's creating that space, which is creating that connection. Also, water is not just for drinking, it's for cleaning, okay? So we know that one of the biggest problems in, in certain third world countries is that water is used for sewage and for drinking and for bathing can't get clean, you can't nourish yourself, you certainly can't clean your clothes. However, Torah spiritually cleanses us, okay? When we learn Torah, when we get excited by Torah, whatever that Torah is, saying Psalms is Torah, because Sefer Tehillim is part of Torah, whatever that is, we are undergoing a, a kind of cleansing, a spiritual, a, a washing of the neshama, okay? Also, rain doesn't actually create a plant. Hashem creates a plant or a seed, but rain helps the seed sprout and grow. You need the earth, you need some sun maybe, depending, and you need water for the seed to sprout. So Torah, says the Midrash, develops the seeds okay, the spiritual seeds in a person's heart. And it waters them. That's a beautiful, beautiful uh, metaphor. Okay. And also, the Medrash tells us that a Jew never tires of studying Torah. Okay. Just as fish swim and in the water, a Jew swims in Torah. Okay, and when we hear something in Torah, something familiar, maybe we've heard it before, something new, it revives us. And, you know, there are times where we want to be motivated, we just, we can't. We listen to a share, we zone out. We, we pick up a Torah book, we zone out. Don't let that defeat you. You're just thirsty and you're not maybe not thirsty for iced tea you're thirsty for lemonade or maybe you're thirsty for plain water or maybe you're thirsty for seltzer go find something that's going to quench your thirst okay there is something that will quench your thirst you just have to find out what it is it might be doing a mitzvah doing a mitzvah one of the mitzvahs of the torah is torah whenever we feel 
a dissatisfaction, whether we are immersed in Torah at that time or not, know that the answer to that satisfaction, the thing that's going to quench our thirst and, um, and even take away our hunger is more Torah, okay? That's what's going to do it. And Torah has this benefit, cleansing us, quenching our thirst, purifying us and it also never gets dull it never we never lose our thirst in life nobody ever woke up and said i'm not thirsty anymore okay or if they do there's something wrong okay we always want we just had water yesterday why do i need water today i just had coffee this morning why do i need it tomorrow morning and so on okay now um so we have this beautiful song and I'm going to just choose a few of the, um, just a, a little bit of some of the um, verses in it, but I really encourage you to read the whole thing. It's very beautiful, okay? If you're fortunate enough to be able to read it in Hebrew, it's, uh, it, the language is a little bit uh, it's a little bit different than the rest of Torah. It's a shira, okay? All right. So um, we're going to go to verse. Two. Okay. So in this, um, okay. So in this uh, shira, um, after Moshe describes the water coming down and so on and how perfect is Hashem, he says to uh, uh, the Jewish people who he's speaking to, um, hey, listen, you're a twisted generation, okay? And a twisted generation is going to come up. And he says that you are an am naval velo chacha. You are kind of like a worthless and unwise nation. Wait a second. Moshe, we know, praised the Jewish people. Now he's rebuking us. He's beginning this rebuke. What does it mean that we are, you know, kind of worthless or foolish and unwise? So Rebbe Nachman has a very interesting way of looking at this, okay? He says that this could be viewed in a way as a compliment. How? Because... The Rebbe teaches that the main way to receive the Torah, as I was speaking about before, to taking that Torah in, is through complete and total simplicity. Putting aside your intellect, your wisdom, or the chachmas of the world, the wisdom of the world, and accepting the Torah as the tzaddikim teach it, okay? And this is something that is a big theme of Rebbe Nachman. And the theme is, is like this, is that our way of thinking, each of us, however you were raised, okay, doesn't matter where you were raised, how you were raised, our way of thinking is constructive from birth. We have our inclinations and then we have been brainwashed. Okay. So what do I mean by that? Okay. So obvious one is communist Russia. It's very apparent to see that people in, who grew up, who were in the former Soviet Union were taught that only ignoramuses believed in Hashem. Okay. All people were taught this, not just Jews. Okay. And that it was somehow something low to believe in God. Okay, this was the, 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 the Soviet chachma of wisdom, the Soviet wisdom, right? Okay, and, only, and great people were scientists and thinkers and, and relied on science and knowledge, okay? Which, of course, we know science changes all the time from year to year to year. And the idea in the former Soviet Union was, was anybody who believed in Hashem was lesser. What do we have in America? We have very similar today, believe it or not. People don't like to hear this comparison, but it's true, okay? Follow the science, but, but what is the science? The science is always changing, okay? We have been taught 
in the West, I'm not going to talk about the East, but in the West to kind of worship science, okay? Or alternatively to worship the arts, okay? If you have a dependent, all right? These are implanted within us. These are not our baseline. We each think that our way of thinking is part of us and that it's plain vanilla. And it's very hard for someone to recognize their biases, especially biases so ingrained as to be an entire way of perception. Okay, remember I was speaking about that empty space? It bears thinking about, we have to, if, you're, if you have a brain, you're going to begin with your brain, you're going to begin with your thoughts. Creating that empty space means recognizing that your beliefs should be examined. Where did they come from? What do they mean? If we try to graft Torah onto what we know, we're going to be successful in some way because there's a little Torah in everything, pretty much. There's Torah in, in the wisdoms of the, of the nations, for sure. But it's still going to be a graft. It's, it's not necessarily going to produce a fruit that is, that is whole. I'm just going to call it whole. I don't know what the correct term is. So this idea is, is for us to recognize. And by the way, this also goes for people who grew up with a religious education. Okay. Some religious education also teaches chachmas that really are antithetical to Torah, okay? And things that we just kind of have a knee-jerk reaction to may be false. They may be true. Some of them may be true, but they may be false. And Moshe Rabbeinu is imparting to us throughout Ha'azinu, if we really read it very carefully, the greatest gift that knowledge, self-knowledge, knowledge of the world, knowledge of the soul, all of this has to be found in Torah in order for us to really be alive, okay? This, honestly, we could sit and go over this song for like maybe six weeks, I think would be a good time, like an hour a week, hour and a half a week, and get just an overview of it. So the idea is this is this is if this is new to you, this concept, and, and you feel shocked by it, okay, sorry, but this is Torah. And and Rebbe Nachman explains to us that our thoughts and the constructs of our thoughts, our seichel, our intellect, gets in the way of us really having understanding. What does he say? It's not only him who says it. The tzaddik can tell us that if you want real wisdom, what do you begin with? Amuna, faith. Because faith is going to add a layer to your understanding and knowledge. And when you see things through the lens of Amuna, okay, suddenly there's an a, a kind of wisdom, you, you can articulate some of it and not some of it. Amuna itself is a kind of wisdom. Faith itself is a kind of wisdom, okay? Unfortunately, you can't necessarily learn Amuna in a book. You can find inspiration for faith in a book, but in order to really learn Amuna, it takes time and it's worth learning. Anything worth learning usually takes time. Rebbe Nachman says, embrace simplicity. Embrace the teachings of the tzaddikim. Because the teachings of the tzaddikim, Moshe Rabbeinu at the head of that list, and, and Rebbe Nachman and other true tzaddikim are going to be the teachings that are going to give you genuine wisdom, and they're going to teach you how to think. Okay. That's really what education in schools used to be in secular schools and universities. At least that was the pretense or that was the goal or the stated goal was we're going to teach you how to think, how to 
how to view something. But the kind of logical steps may not always be applicable in Torah. There's a different kind of logic, the logic of Bina, okay? And Bina is a, a, it often translated as understanding, but it's actually the ability to take disparate bits of information and pull out an insight or a truth from them greater than the sum of its parts, okay? Also, AKA, women's intuition, okay? All right, so um, Rebbe Nachman has a very special way of reading that verse, Verse, okay, this, this um, unwise nation. Okay, what time is it? Okay, I don't wanna, I really wanna be able to divide this up so we can get to the Zoysa Bracha. Okay, now, the, um, the Torah also, this Hazinu also has a verse about Hashem comforting us, okay? Just one second. Okay, and the last part of Ha'azinu, the song, is that there's comfort for the Jewish people, because there was a lot of rebuke. I mentioned there was rebuke. We don't have time to go verse by verse. But the last part is comfort and the divine promise that justice is going to be given to the oppressors, the people who oppress the Jewish people on the surface, that's the shot reading, okay, which is very valid, okay. We'll talk about that in a minute, but also within ourselves, okay, we can use this to comfort ourselves and know that if we want to really embrace this comfort fully, we have to mete out justice to our inner oppressors as well, our Yetzir Hara. Okay, the, the inclination that leads us to despair, sadness, depression, bitterness, anger, uh, lack of lack of amona, um, and so on and so forth. Okay, so everything we read in Ha'azinu, we can read it shot, and we can also read it at so many other levels. The level that Rebbe Nachman gives us such beautiful insights into is the psycho-spiritual, us as a human being. Okay, what are we going to learn from this? Okay, it's very nice. Our enemies are going to get theirs. Okay, but what can we take from it? it? It personally, okay? All right, now, Hashem will comfort us, and he also gives us the explicit promise that Hashem is going to resurrect the dead. Techias hamesim, techiat hametim. Okay. Now, existence for humankind or for creation is divided into five periods. There's life in this world. Okay. Olam hazeh. That's number one. Number two, there's Gan Eden. Okay, we know that as the Garden of Eden, but what it's referring to here is Gan Eden, where the souls of the tzaddikim are stored until techiyat hametim, okay, techiyas hamesim, the resurrection of the dead, okay? For those of you, hold on one second, let me see if I have a copy here. For those of you who want to learn just a teeny bit more about this, available on Amazon, Mashiach, Hope for Turbulent Times. There's questions and answers about the future existence and what's going to be. Um, there's only a few opinions because there are thousands. However, this idea is, is that Tehiyat Hametim is, should be comforting to you because it's when the righteous who went to the grave come back to life. And the promises is in their own bodies, healed, okay, clothed, okay, because Hashem doesn't want us to rise up with no clothes on. And this will start another period of existence, another period of the world, okay? And that's the era of Mashiach, okay? Which comes first, Tehiyas Hamesim or whatever, Usually say people say Mashiach comes first when Hashem is going to 
restore the dead to life. Now, what's so interesting, okay, is that how do they get restored? With a tal, with a dew, a special dew of revival. And also with the loose bone, which is a tiny little bone. Most say it's a, like the base of your skull. Some say it's at the base of your tailbone. There are different opinions, depending which Mikubal you read. Okay. And the idea is, is that contains, that's an indestructible bone that contains all the spiritual DNA necessary for a complete revival of the person. I always think of it like a stem cell, a spiritual stem cell. Okay. There's something in there in that little tiny bone that we're going to be able to come to life fully from that little tiny bone. And it's going to be, we're going to be sprinkled on with a special dew. What that really means, I don't know, but because we're speaking about Torah being like dew and rain, we know it has to do with Torah. Okay, next. Um, oh, I, I will finish. So that period is going to be preceded by um, a special day of judgment, evaluation, and so on. And then we have Olam Haba, okay? And that's the world to come. And that is this special existence, okay, where the body becomes less and less and less uh, substantial in a way. And the Neshama becomes more and more substantial. There is a, now how this will look, I don't know. Does it mean literally? I don't know. But what we do know is that eventually the soul is going to take precedence. And if anybody remembers reading anything about Adam, Harishon, and the first human being, Adam, and how his body was a body composed of light, okay, or, and then after the fall, after the big transgression, he had to have or or, which is spelled the difference between an olive and an eye and skin, okay, rather than light. So we're going to revert back to light, okay? This should be comforting. I find it very comforting, okay? Because I envision us being able to meet all the great Sadiqim. And it's beyond the scope of this class to go into it anymore. But if you're interested, you could Google it. There's a really good site by... Chabad called, I think it's called Kabbalah Online. It's actually very good with a lot of information. It's probably something there that you could read. Okay, now, um, where am I? Okay. Okay, so those are the five periods of creation. Now, now what happens is, is Moshe teaches this song along with Yehoshua to the children of Israel. He wants them to understand that the, uh, that the song has value and they must learn it. So when you read it, okay, you're going to hear it this Shabbat, okay, maybe you'll reread it. If Hebrew is not your first language, read it in English as well. And take this and find some commentary for yourself on Ha'azinu. If you have even the, like, um, the, I don't, I don't remember the name of this uh, particular Chumash, what is this? The, uh, the Stone Edition Chumash with a great translation has some commentary. But really, we should learn this song. This was Moshe's second to last act, okay? This was Ha'azinu, the song. We should learn it, okay? Now, he teaches us the song, and he alludes to the fact that the Torah, every single line, dot, okay, nakuda, vowel, whatever, is vitally important it contains meaning after meaning after meaning okay so i wanted to give you an example so we know the zohar okay everybody knows the zohar kodesh written by rabbi shimon bar yochai okay a major kabbalistic text the zohar is actually a commentary 
uh, Kabbalistic commentary on the five books of Moses. Then there is something amazing called the Tikkune Zohar. And this was written also by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai with his son Elazar and also with commentary supplied by who? Contributions from who? The Ra'aya Mehemna. That means faithful shepherd in Aramaic. And who is this faithful shepherd? Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher. And Moshe is called the faithful shepherd. If you notice, all the Avos were shepherds. Being a shepherd is a good thing in the Torah. Rabbi Nachman refers to it in, um, in his text, Azamra, as well. This concept of the Raya Mehemna, the faithful shepherd, is a concept of the tzaddik whose bond with the Jewish people is tremendous. His love for the Jewish people and his willingness to toil, to uplift and save and help and teach the Jewish people is beyond compare. And so they can even be considered to um, just two names for the same thing, Sadik Emet, Sadik Emet or Sadik Emes, the true Sadik and the faithful shepherd. And this idea is, is that in the Tikkune Zohar, Moshe's neshama came and gave commentary to Rashbi, to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, to his son Elazar, and also, also other neshamas came down, other souls came down, including Adam, the first man, the first human being, excuse me, and Eliyahu Hanabi, Elijah the prophet, and others. And they came to give their teachings into this amazing book. And what was this book? And why did I take the long way around? So you have to understand the greatness of this book. This text is a commentary on the first word in the Chumash in the Torah. Breshit, Breshis. Okay, in the beginning. The Tikkuni Zohar required all those great tzaddikims, neshamas, neshamot, to come just to give commentary on word one of the Torah. So what is this? What is this idea here? This idea is to show us that every dot, every line, every, every shape of every letter, you know, there's some large letters and some small letters, every word, every paragraph has a meaning and layers and layers and layers of meaning. Meaning we can't even begin to scratch the surface of. And Moshe wanted to impress that upon us, okay? And the idea for us, is to know that our job, okay, as the sages say, is to toil, but not to finish. We're not gonna finish, okay? We're never gonna finish toiling in Torah. It doesn't matter, you can be the biggest Talmud Chacham in the world, you're not gonna finish because there are layers and layers and layers and layers and layers of meaning, okay? So with our foolishness and our unwiseness, okay, which is Rebbe Nachman's beautiful, positive way of describing, um, uh, uh, describing what that really means. We also have to realize and recognize the pshat, the simple meaning. Yeah, we don't know anything. And as Rebbe Nachman said, the more you know, okay, he said, now I really know nothing. The greater his knowledge, the more he realized how little he knew. And so for those of you at various stage of your Torah journey and your Torah le learning journey, you will recognize, you will get to a point that one day that seesaw is going to, you're going to be going up and up and up. I know this and I know that. All of a sudden that seesaw is going to go clunk because the weight of what you don't know, that is going to overshadow. And when that happens, you will have tasted the sweetness of Torah because you'll be so excited that there's so much you don't know.
so much to chase after and, and imbibe with that dew, that rain that we spoke of, that water that's going to give you life. Okay. Now, we covered, we did a very quick, quick, quick overview of um, Ha'azinu, the song. Um, and, and if you came and made a really good like to suggest you go back to the beginning because it really all ties together what happened at the end and what happens in the beginning. And now we're going to go to the next Parsha, which we're going to read on Simplest Torah. And when we finish, then we go right back. If you go to Shul, you will see they're going to go and start Bracious or a Bereshit. Okay, they're going to start right from the beginning again. It's a very joyous celebration, and it's really worth being there for the beginning and the end, because each of us is a part of it. Each of us has a letter in the Torah. Okay, so come be a part of it. All right, if you can. Okay, so in now we're going to go to the Zot HaBaracha. Okay, so... All right, let me see. Okay, so it begins the Zos Abracha Asher Berach Moshe Ish HaElokim Es Bnei Yisrael Lichnei Moso. Okay, and this is the Baracha that Moshe Ish HaElokim. Okay, the man of God gave to the children of Israel before his death. Okay, what is this Ish HaElokim? Okay. This man of God. What is that title? Do you recall hearing this before? So the, it's an unusual title. And it's the title, man of God, okay, is Moshe has earned this title. Why? Why has he earned this title? Because he does God's will, because he gave the Torah, because he led the Jewish people, because he's so smart and wise, because he's so good. No. The Medrash tells us. Moshe earned this title because he praised and defended the Jewish people. Simple. Okay. He defended us and he praised us. Therefore, he was a man of God. And Moshe looked not at the bad. I mean, he was there rebuking us in Hazinu. He's rebuked us a lot. Moshe Rabbeinu has rebuked us so much. But the rebuke, again, was only for the purpose of the tikkun, the correction. And it was not without the recognition that what makes us great is in our brains and is in our amazing culinary traditions, okay, or our you know, all, all the Jewish doctors and all the Jewish lawyers and all the Jewish geniuses, we have that. What makes us great is our neshama because we accepted the Torah when the nations refused it. That's it. That's what the Medrash says very clearly. Moshe recognized our greatness because we said, okay, we will do, and then we'll listen. We'll do it, what you say, and then we'll begin to dig in and figure out what, what everything means, okay? And the idea is of Nase Venishma is that that comes from that kind of knowledge that I spoke about earlier, which is Emuna. I call it, I'll classify it as a kind of knowledge faith because belief and faith is a kind of knowing. Okay, think about that. And so the Jewish people, all the nations of the world said, I don't want to do that. That's too hard. I, I don't want to do this. Uh, you know, I have to eat kosher. That's expensive. I, I don't want to do that. I have to keep the Sabbath. But hey, you know, what if I really feel like cleaning the house on? I mean, that's a good thing, isn't it? And, uh, you know, and uh, oh, you can't do this. And oh, you can't do that. I don't want to do that. And oh, you have to do this and you have to do that. No, I don't want to do that. And what do you mean? What do you mean I have to live in a Jewish community? Uh, I I don't like I don't like to live all alone. People are people are annoying. Okay. There's so many things in Torah. And we said okay to it. Do we live up to it perfectly? No. But scratch the surface. And within each of us, 
is this connection that cannot be denied because it's in your spiritual DNA. You know, there's this talk of cellular memory. Okay. Do the cells have a memory? I don't know. Maybe they do. But certainly the cells of the soul, okay, aspects of the soul have a memory. And our souls are always connected. And even someone who has to have karik, okay, uh, uh, being cut off from the Jewish people, God forbid, still has other bonds and binds. There's very rare that somebody's completely karik because we have 613 mitzvahs and each one of them connects to Hashem. So this idea is, is that Moshe earned his title as Ish Hakim because he defended the Jewish people and praised them. He recognized that we were an Am Segula, a treasured people. What does that also teach us? So, okay. It means also that anyone else who defends and praises the Jewish people, do they earn that title? I don't know. But they certainly really receive some of that elevation, including us Jews, okay? Because Moshe was Jewish. It can be very difficult sometimes to defend us and to praise us. The easiest way to do it is to just not say anything bad, okay? To look for the good. And remember, the Raya Mehemna, the faithful shepherd, is what Rebbe Nachman speaks about in his foundational teaching, Azamra, which of course means I will sing, song connection, because the shepherd sings, okay? You see that, how that beautiful, this beautiful teaching, Azamra, really fits in with his, but fits in with every parsha. And the idea is to look for the good in other people, and especially in the Jewish people, okay? We have to. It's a requirement, according to Rebbe Nachman. And also to look for the good in ourselves, okay? It's okay to defend yourself. It doesn't mean to be defensive and to not admit you've done wrong. We have to all do tshuva. We're about to, you know, enter Yom Kippur, okay? But we also have to see the good in ourselves. It's only a person with a low self-esteem that really projects outwards onto others and sees the negative in this one and that one. When we work on ourselves and we really have this Azamra approach of Rebbe Nachman's, which Moshe Rabbeinu taught us, he taught us it even in Ha'azinu, okay? He praised us, okay? And he's praising us in Vizot HaBracha as well. Because of this, he's an Isha Elohim. And we can learn from that. The reason why we have the tzaddikim, okay, is um, it's a gift from Hashem, these holy, righteous people, but they're not only here to teach us and to help us connect to Hashem, but they're also here to show us how we should look at other people and ourselves. It's so important, very important. Okay, now, um, let's see, what time is it? We have a little, I, I'm, I really don't want to leave until we finish this. So if anybody has to go early, I think we might run a little over. I'm sorry. I apologize. Okay. So um, okay. Why are we called an Am Segula? Okay, this um, the treasured people. So Rebbe Nachman explains that we're called an Am Segula because a segula is like, it can be called a charm or an unusual remedy. It's not always so obvious why it would heal or why it would fix things. So there is a, you know, there's a segula to light a candle for 40 days for this tzaddik and that tzaddik. Why does that fix something? So we have to really dig deep to find out the whys of a segula, but the basic thing the, the basic idea is, is that the real reason, yes, we accepted the Torah, the nations refused it, is because it's a segula. We defy understanding why Hashem loves us, okay? Defies our understanding. Why does Hashem love us? Okay. 
okay, we accepted the Torah, true. And that gives Moshe his title. But why does Hashem love us? And how can we be chosen? Okay. So Rebbe Nachman teaches that when someone serves Hashem by following the Torah, okay, then Hashem is going to reveal himself to that person, commensurate with their ability to see. So what does that mean by following the Torah? Does it mean keeping Shabbat and eating kosher? Yes, but it also means the really hard mitzvot. The really hard ones are relationship mitzvot. Okay, the mitzvahs that have to do with interpersonal relationships, being forgiving, not holding a grudge, and so on and so forth. Seeing the good in others, giving tzedakah copiously as much as you can, helping other people both with your time and your resources, your, your, your finances. Okay, this is, this is the designation for chosenness. And because of that, the more we toil the more we toil, not only in our understanding, but in our actions, to come closer to Hashem. So again, everybody has to start from where they're at, wherever you're at. But if you stay there, are you a segula? Mm, I don't know. You are, but if you really want to be a segula, you push yourself, you grow. How much? To the point of a little discomfort, not so uncomfortable that you fall off the cliff, but a little discomfort. Okay, that helps us grow. And when we do this, the, the Rebbe says, actually, Reb Nussin says, commensurate with how much a person is willing to sacrifice for Hashem, that person merits a revelation or understanding of godliness. And then that person will merit to really be a full on segula. So we call this Mazirus Nefesh, okay, soul sacrifice. Everybody has an area or two, or like me, 15, in which I need to improve, maybe even more than 15, maybe 50. Okay, everybody has areas in which they need to improve. Okay, we have three areas of relationship. The two main mitzvah areas are the mitzvahs between man and man, person to person relationships, and the mitzvahs between man and God. Okay. So Shabbat is more of a man to God or not wearing shotness, that blend of linen and wool is man to God mitzvah. They don't always make sense. And then we have relationship mitzvahs. We have to give so much to tzedakah. We have to be kind. We have to have a sever upon them. We have to smile at people. Okay. Show them a kind face. So we have to forgive people and so on. Very timely, right? Forgiveness right now. And we have to do all of this. And then we have this relationship with ourself, which is a relationship dependent on our relationship with Hashem and our relationship with other people. As a matter of fact, I don't think you can unknot this, this braid of three. Okay. And when we begin to really live with a little Messiah Snapfish, a little soul sacrifice, okay? You have children, you know what a sacrifice it was. You wake up in the middle of the night, okay? Everybody's, you know, you wake when you wake up, you've had a baby, you have one baby that sleeps through the night and the other baby that cries every 30 seconds, just when you go back to sleep, okay? You know that you don't get what you want, you buy your kid what they need, okay? You know, if there's a trade-off. So we do this for Hashem too. And ultimately, we're not real. We're doing it for Hashem out of love for him, but ultimately we're doing it for ourselves because Hashem doesn't need us to love him. He loves it when we love him. He yearns and desires for us to love him, but he doesn't have a need because he's perfect and complete without it. Okay. He doesn't need anything from us. However, he loves us so much that he yearns. He has a desire for us to love him. Why? For his sake. I don't know, maybe. However, for sure, for our sake, because our love of God is instructed to us as human beings. We can't grow without it. So people who grew up with this very idea of a punitive God or, a, you know, um, very often in some of the evangelical strains of Christianity, I'm just giving them as an example, and also in the past in some strains of Judaism, 
just this whole thing of punitive, punitive, punitive. I had somebody say to me, um, she said to me that she uh, grew up wait, thinking that Hashem was waiting for her to mess up. That was her life. Oh my goodness. Can you imagine? No, Hashem loves us. You're his sabula. You're beloved to him. He treasures you. Okay. So we want to remember that. And we want to take that idea and go with it. Okay. That's how we embrace and accept our chosenness. And again, the Jewish people, yes, we're chosen because we accepted Torah, but we're also chosen for an irrational reasons. They're irrational reasons. God loves us. Why? I don't know. We can be very annoying. Okay. Some of us can. I can be very annoying. Okay. But God loves us. Okay. And the more we love him back by doing the, the, the living the paths and walking the paths that he recommends for us. Okay. The more he reveals himself to us, you know, you could sit and study Kabbalah until you're blue in the face. But if you're missing that service component of Hashem, you have no revelation of godliness at all. Yet someone, okay, who can put an extra coin beyond their 10%, beyond their 20% into tzedakah, because Hashem says this is the time of year you give tzedakah above and beyond. Okay, most of us give the regular, but above and that person merits for, for 10 cents merits a revelation of godliness. It's quite amazing. Okay, now uh, we're going to keep going. All right. Um, Moshe describes Hashem's love for the Jewish people. He says he loved the tribes greatly. And he then goes into this blessings of the tribes. Again, we can't go text line by line, text by text. We're unable to do that today. However, however, please read the Parsha. It's fascinating, the blessings for the tribes. Okay. Unless um, your family are Kohanim or some Levian. We don't know what tribes we belong to. Most of, most of us do not have, you know, that's lost in tradition. When Mashiach comes, we'll find out what tribes we belong to. That's what they tell us. It's going to be interesting. Okay. So then Moshe blesses the tribes. As a matter of fact, that shows why he is the Ra'ayah Mahamna, the faithful shepherd. He loved us so much that his last act before he died, what? To bless us. He sat and he blessed each tribe with so much love. Isn't that beautiful? That's his last act. Okay, now, um, one second. I want to read. Oh, this is so beautiful. Okay, so Moshe died. Okay, he passed away with a um, like a divine kiss. Okay. There's a special thing about his death. Um, but what I want to talk to is a little bit about um, what the spiritual aspect of some of his death is. And this is what Reb Nussin explains. So first of all, the name Moshe Rabbeinu. We usually call Moshe, Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu. Moses, our teacher, okay? A Rebbe is a teacher. So a rabbi is a teacher too. So Moshe Rabbeinu. Okay, Moshe, our teacher, has the, has the gematria of 613. We know what that is. Those are the mitzvot of the Torah, 613 mitzvahs in the Torah. Okay, now the Zohar says that Moshe's passing was at a very high level called the Ra'ava de Ra'avin, which is Aramaic also. And it means the will of wills the highest level of divine will. There was something very unusual about his leaving his body in this world. And that's because his entire being was geared towards serving Hashem, bringing Hashem pleasure and joy. 
that is a part of the, a component of Moshe's love for us. Okay, how do you bring a, a parent pleasure and joy? You praise their children. You love their children. Moshe loved Hashem's children, and he wanted to give Hashem pleasure and joy through this. And because his life was dedicated to giving Hashem such nachas, okay, he aroused this special uh, ratzon, this special divine will and favor. Okay, and what Reb Nassim reminds us from this is because Moshe was sick, Moshe Rabbeinu was 613, and there are 613 mitzvahs, and Moshe attained this special sweet love of Hashem, this special will of Hashem, when we learn the mitzvahs, when we engage in the mitzvahs, all 613, obviously we can't do all of those today, we don't have the Beit, Beit HaMikdash, but we also, we also arouse this divine will on us. The more we do mitzvot, the more Hashem's will comes down to us, okay? It might be, it might feel very slight, you might not notice it, but the more there are mitzvot in your life, the more you feel that sweetness in the relationship, okay? So um, Moshe, passed away. And whenever I read the, the whole Parsha, two places in the Torah where I cry. When, when um, Yaakov and Yosef are re reunited, I lose it. And then also here, and I'm losing it now, which is so touching, but we're not reading every verse, so I don't have to really sob. And, you know, Moshe left us. He didn't leave us alone. He left us Yehoshua. And we have the tzaddikim who can guide us, especially Rebbe Nachman, who can guide us in this life to connect with Hashem, to connect with the Jewish people, and to connect with ourselves and really understand who we are. Thank God. But it's still sad. Okay, now, we know that Moshe lived 120 years, okay? Why 120 years? Because... There are, remember, um, Moshe was a Isha Elohim, okay, the man of God. There are 120 permutations, okay, 120 versions of Hashem's name, Elohim. You can mix up the letters, and there are different versions of it, okay? And that represents the revelation of, of godliness. And Moshe Rabbeinu lived for the 120 years because he was able to draw godliness, divinity down in this world through the Torah. And we know that Hillel and um, Yochanan ben Zakkai and Rabbi Akiva and others lived Sarah 120 years. And when we wish someone good health and long life, we always say Ad 120, two 120 or beyond. Okay, a righteous life takes 120 years. Could somebody be righteous and live a lot less? Yes, of course. But there's a component of righteousness that is connected with this concept of Elohim. Okay, that name of Hashem, 120 is this connection with the 120 permutations of that name. And Elohim is the name, when we use the name Elohim of Hashem, it is a name that um, means justice and righteousness and even judgment to a certain extent. And if you remember way back in the beginning of our class for Ha'azinu, we spoke about the uh, Shira, the nine Shira, okay, and the 10th Shir, the nine feminine songs of prophecy or songs of prophecy that are given a feminine title and the 10th one which is when Mashiach comes and we learn that right now we have this definite um we, we need all Hashem's mercy in this world okay and it's very hard for us to bear with judgment however however after Mashiach comes because we're going to be at such a high level, we're going to love this justice and judgment as much as we love the mercy. So Elohim is actually a very, it's a very high name and it represents in a way the future. 
And we know on Yom Kippur, we're told that there's judgment, Rosh Hashanah's judgment, but really, really Yom Kippur is mercy. Okay, it's compassion, it's Hashem's love. So as you go into Yom Kippur, don't feel bad. Don't beat yourself up. Do your confessions, do your tshuva, and remember that Hashem loves you and he's showering you with mercy and compassion the way he did with Moshe. Now, we can't, nobody knows Moshe's burial place. So people take stabs at it all the time. And there are many reasons why. The simple reason is, is because it, the, the Torah teaches that if people knew where Moshe was buried, they would go there to uh, daven and even the nations would go and it might lead to idol worship. But also, also, um, Reb Nassim explains that Moshe was so great that his burial place is concealed because we go to a tzaddik's grave to pray and we ask them to pray for us, okay, to give us blessings, to intercede. And his prayers would just be too great. They would just shake up the whole world. And Hashem isn't ready for the world to be shaken up or shook up, excuse me. Okay, not ready yet. Okay, we're not, we're not quite there yet. It feels like we're there. The whole world has gone crazy, but we're not quite there yet ready for the level of Moshe Rabbeinu's prayers. And what we must re remember about Moshe Rabbeinu, the architectural tzaddik who loved us, the Ra'ayah Mehemna, the faithful shepherd, is what the sages teach, is that a tzaddik is greater after death than in this life because a tzaddik is no longer constrained by their bodies, which is why we go to the Kavarim, the grave sites of the tzaddikim to Davin, for them to intercede on our behalf. And yes, we can ask Hashem directly. We must ask Hashem directly, but the tzaddikim also have the power of their relationship with Hashem, their love for the Jewish people, their unbelievable desire to give Hashem pleasure and joy, and nachas, okay, and we can rely on them to lift us out of the very uh, heavy lives we sometimes lead. Now, I think we are done for today. Um, we stayed over. I apologize for for those of you who you know had to have to go somewhere. Before we go, before I say wish you a good year, are there any questions or comments? Okay, you can unmute yourself or you can type. No? Okay. All right. So I want to say to you all, Gamarcha Tima Tova, Gamarcha Sima Tova, really you should be sealed for a very good year. Um, have a meaningful fast, an easy fast. May it really be a, a time for you of healing and remember that Hashem's mercy is with us on Yom Kippur, his compassion, his love for us. We want to connect to the day at that level. At least in Breslau, we really do. It's a sweet day, a holy day, okay? And I wish you all the best. And, and, and God willing, we will see each other in the coming year. Thanks again to Dr. Eleanor Budas for sponsoring the Shi'orim. And I look forward to seeing you. All the best, everyone. Thank you.